Speedrunning is all about going fast. This statement is pretty obvious when taking at face value, but how do we actually accomplish this? Well, the most common answer would be practice and developing strats to beat the game. As a speedrunner, mastering aspects of that game is directly rewarded in reduction of time. And it's for that reason speedrunners value practice so highly. But what if I told you there's an extremely important skill that one has to master that sits at the core of speedrunning? And it's not one that many would think of when they start their speedrunning journey. This skill, or rather action, is resetting. As most speedrunning games face a linear progression, with games such as SM64 or Celeste often being top picks, viewers are often faced with a reset happening when the runner makes a mistake. Unless I die, we'll go the whole way. That results in a death or a big time loss. But this simple form of resetting is only the beginning because Minecraft speedrunners have, for the past decade, researched and perfected a formula of resetting that combines both tech and strategy into an art form that's incredible to watch, but is hard to understand for a casual viewer. To understand how resetting works in Minecraft, we first have to understand how Minecraft itself generates its worlds. Each Minecraft world, or rather seed, is generated based on a sound map. And then this map is then converted into terrain and biomes that players are met with. What this effectively means is that each world a speedrunner loads into is random. In the beginning of Minecraft's speedrunning journey, players struggled with finding a reliable way to beat the game. Survival mode. This is how to survive your first night. Any potential routes that were being theorized were based on assumptions, but they did know one thing, that the biggest hurdle in micro speedrunning is RNG. RNG, or random number generator, is a term that many use to describe an event or result that happens in-game that's out of the control of players. This could range from what seed you've just loaded into, to how many endermen you just killed in order to obtain 12 ender pearls. While all of these events are controlled internally by the game itself, speedrunners saw it as a massive setback as obtaining the unnecessary RNG to beat the game on a random seed was mind-blowing back then. This hurdle quickly became apparent in how speedrunners approached Minecraft in 2011 and onwards. Many would prefer to play set seed, meaning that the seed itself was one they had found and practiced beforehand. Usually it had a lot of ice in the end portal, and favorable aspects such as the desert close to spawn and easy access to food. Now, speedrunners could instead focus on mechanical skill and shared grit to beat Minecraft. Setsi just brought a sense of familiarity and reliability that many enjoyed as its formula reflected many other speedrunning games that were gaining traction back then. The other major category that speedrunners developed was Random Seed. Now, this category was honestly one that took quite a while to gain traction, as many didn't like the sheer amount of RNG they had to compete against in each new seed they spawned into. Many would often reset for seemingly random spawns, such as the forest spawn, to obtain the necessary tools and food to complete a run. By today's standards, these type of runs can be compared to a let's play, as many were more focused on exploring each seed hoping that they would obtain the necessary biomes and items to complete the game. Like I said, I have officially finished the Ender Dragon, hardcore mode, and everything. And other than that, I'll talk to you guys later. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. This type of resetting would stand for quite a bit, as the developments of micro speedrunning mostly went towards the set city category. A few would, however, see things differently. Enter the Japanese players. This group would go on to revolutionize how random seed was played, as they came up with new insightful ways to approach seeds, thus setting a path of what I would personally define as the first meta of random seed. The age of pre 1.9 was upon the speedrunning community. It didn't take long for one player in the Japanese community to shine brighter than many others, and that player was Taro Kitchen. When watching his pre 1.9 world record, it's clear to see how his playstyle was different from what I described earlier. And that was because one defining aspect of resetting came into play. He would intentionally reset for savannah or desert spawns, as he knew these biomes provided blocks, wood, food, 
and wool for the necessary items to beat the game, while the desert itself provided a clear and open space for endermen to spawn during the night. What the Japanese community had cracked was how you should reset, and it all came down to intent. What you did using the knowledge you had to fulfill a goal, and intentionally resetting for favorable aspects would make each and every run in the future faster as a direct consequence. This aspect of resetting is still a cornerstone of the Minecraft speedrunning meta, and it truly deserves its place in the Minecraft speedrunning history book. As 2015 came and went, Minecraft speedrunning became more and more developed as runs started pushing what was possible at the time. New innovations such as tower strats optimized the category to new heights, as the era of pre-1.9 would stand tall all the way into mid-2019, when Mojang finally decided to change the way ender pearls could be obtained. So far, speedrunners would reset for viable savanna and desert biomes that featured a flat enough land to spawn enough mobs, but on one hot summer day, Mojang released a freshly printed update full of bugs. And one of those bugs would allow micro speedrunners to abuse villager trading mechanics. Villagers could restock infinitely during daytime, meaning that if you somehow got enough materials to trade, you could do so until you got enough ender pearls to finish the run. But this introduced a new hurdle. How could you even obtain enough emeralds to trade with a villager in the first place? After looking into every villager trade, a new route was discovered. That discovery came in the form of a humble Fletcher. Now all speedrunners had to do was get lots of lots of sticks. The first obvious choice was forests, as literally every Minecraft world had forests. This meant that any seed also only required a nearby village to trade with, making resetting very lenient. Despite this benefit, there was still a glaring issue that had to be resolved. Actually chopping down a wood manually just wasn't really feasible for times they wanted to achieve. Runs would spend around 10 minutes manually chopping down wood, hindering pace immensely, and this made strat developers look into more reasonable options. Introducing a Minecraft temple. Originally a death trap for novice players, but for speedrunners it was a gold mine, because underneath it was 19T that would allow them to blow up either a wooden house or a dark oak forest to obtain the needed sticks to trade for ender pearls. The Minecraft speedrunners of 1.14.4 redefined resetting once again, as they now had to factor in another thing in their resetting. Structures. As speedrunners loaded into seeds, they not only had to think of what biome they spawned in, but they also had to reset if there was no village or temple close to spawn. But this route had the huge inherent flaw, and it all came down to how the cleric rolled its trades. You see, a cleric is a profession villagers can obtain, and in this case, trading with one will eventually provide the player with ender pearls. However, in some cases, it doesn't. To be more precise, every one in three clerics will not provide an ender pearl trade, but instead it will give the player a glass bottle. For resetting, this was not something many liked, as this meant that one in every three runs was fated to die before it even started. The era of 1.14.4 marked a new way to reset, as resetting for structures became an integral part of speedrunning as a whole. The solution to obtain ender pearls while fast, was also inconsistent, giving many players a headache on how to get around it. Luckily, they didn't have to, because Mojang would once again release a major update, the 1.16 update. The 1.16 update brought with it two important additions to the game that was vital for speedrunners, and the first was Piglins. These nether mobs had a nifty feature that would allow them to trade gold ingots for various random items. Many of these random trades aren't really that special, but one trade in particular revolutionized how speedrunners would speedrun the game, Ender Pearls. Piglins had a 4.73% chance to drop 4 to 8 pearls, meaning that on average you could trade around 20 gold ingots with a piglin to obtain the pearl trade. What followed this discovery was a shift in how speedrunners would go about obtaining ender pearls. But surprisingly, this didn't change much in terms of how players would reset. 
Many would still reset for desert spawns, find a village and enter the nether. After entering, speedrunners would then tediously mine for gold nuggets, craft those nuggets into ingots and then trade them with piglins. This new meta would later be referred to as the classic route, seeing as it featured a somewhat similar style of resetting as the older versions of Minecraft. Though this route was incredibly fast, it had one major flaw. Oh well, yeah, faster doesn't mean easier. The low chance of actually obtaining enderpearls meant that many runners died in the nether after the runner failed to get lucky enough to receive an enderpearl trade. What this meant is that runners would spawn in a seed, route an entire village for food and beds, enter the nether and mine gold for multiple minutes and only then know if they should reset the run. This meant that the process of resetting was very slow as there is no way of knowing if your run was doomed to fail until you actually traded each gold, which typically happened by around a 10 minute to 12 minute mark. Though this route was incredibly inconsistent, it did result in many notable achievements. The first sub 20 and first sub 15 both came from the classic meta. Both those runs, especially the sub 15, were both rare exceptions to the wildly unfavorable odds of the classic route actually yielding results. In an effort to remove the inconsistency that made finishing the average classic speedrun quite difficult, strat developers shifted their focus off of piglins, setting their sights instead on a structure known as a bastion remnant. In total, there are four different versions of these bastion remnants, and as complicated as they might be, there were a few brave figures such as Tiwags and Fyro that began developing strategies that would allow players to take advantage of the incredible amount of resources that Bastions had to offer. But it wasn't just that, large amount of piglins also spawned in Bastions, removing the need to simply hope for nearby piglins that runners had to do in the classic era. The process of getting the necessary materials to complete the speedrun was becoming more streamlined. Getting enderpearls by herding numerous Bastion piglins into the same hole and then trading them over a stack of gold had become a realistic and consistent strategy that runners could intentionally reset for. Despite Bastions being added to the speedrunning route, many things didn't change in the early game. The comfort of having a village was one that many didn't want to stray away from, but this would soon change as one strat developer began posing an important question about the current state of the early game resetting. K4 was a speedrunner who thought that Minecraft speedrunning wasn't reaching its full potential. They saw that many of the top speedrunners had a wrong approach to how you should speedrun the game. They suspected that the 116 route was tailored too much towards optimizing the chance of a run being completed, whether it be lowering the chance of bad RNG or lowering the chance of a player's mechanical error affecting the run. What if you got 6 or even 5 blaze rods instead of 7? And what if you focused on taking less damage and spent less time collecting food? This thought process would develop further as three start developers called Twags, LSD Gaga and Fyro began looking at new ways to enter the nether through oceans. And they found a really good and consistent route for just doing that. Twags suggested that spawning on beaches, locating shipwrecks and obtaining iron was a reliable way to obtain the tools you need. Furthermore, LSD Gaga would look into new possibilities of a magma ravine being a viable way to enter the nether and with the help of both Twags and Fyro, new nether portals were soon developed and published. All of these innovations were slowly changing how runners should reset. The minimalistic approach that developed around the concept of sharp efficiency and not ticking the same box twice would be dubbed as hypermodern. Continuing on with the theme of reducing unnecessary time loss, K4 would then go on to publish several new strategies on how to avoid doing just that. The most prominent of those strategies was preferred to as microlensing or E-Ray for short. E-Raying allowed speedrunners to scan the nether from their portal and determine whether or not a bastion was nearby. Seeing as the bastion was a structure which was now essentially required to complete a speedrun, runners were now able to reliably find out if a seed was worth playing the moment they entered the nether. In terms of reset efficiency, this development was tremendous as it eliminated 2-3 to three minutes of bastion searching that players previously did. As the meta continued to change drastically over the next few months, some players found this hypermodern mentality, as the reset style was coined, to be an incredible change. Resetting seemed more and more like a skill players could pick up and practice, as recognizing the difference between a good and a bad seed became easier over time. A player's ability to do this was what would set them apart from the rest, 
as it was an important skill to become a consistent top runner. And one of the players that would crack reset efficiency code early was Ninja Brain. Ninja Brain was a very analytical runner who not only contributed to the development of hypermodern speedrunning by creating various informative guides, but also because he was a speedrunner himself, one that would regularly get on great pace. Ninja Brain's resetting was so incredibly efficient that one member of the community couldn't help but scratch his head and wonder, how could I replicate Ninja Brain's pace? This player was talking Mime. Now, Mime was a speedrunner with coding background who developed the first ever stat tracker after being inspired by Ninja Brain's reset abilities. This tracker would display each and every time a player entered a seed what time you mined your first wood, whether or not you enter the nether, and so on. It would then compile all that data into viewable format, so that other speedrunners could compare and figure out what worked for resetting and what didn't. With Mime's stat tracker, resetting would continue to get more and more optimized, providing speedrunners with a way to observe their playstyle in an in-depth manner, and make changes based on the statistics in order to improve. But if there's one thing you should know about micro speedrunners, it's that reset efficiency will never reach its peak. As resetting became stricter, runners were met with a constant loading screen, and many runners that had bad hardware would face a harder time playing the game. But luckily, new mods were developed to make Minecraft itself run smoother. Mods such as Starlight, Sodium, and Lithium were all mods that make Minecraft not only load worlds faster, but also made the gameplay experience more smoother. Speedrunners were clearly heading to a new type of resetting, one that emphasized making changes outside of the run itself, not involving in-gaming strategies like previous methods did. And this sentiment would be shown once again as one speedrunner decided to do something that no one else had done before. Hamason, the runner in question, would be inspired to do just that. After seeing another speedrunner, asked the speedrunning moderators if they could speedrun using more than one instance of Minecraft. With an idea in mind, Hamason started up the stream and played three Minecrafts at the same time being able to reset and load new seeds on two Minecrafts while playing on the third. Within only a few months, speedrunners went from playing a single instance of Minecraft to three, four, six, nine, and even up to 30. This new wall, as it was called, brought with it a new fresh set of challenges, as well as new potential to speedruns. Speedrunners could be a lot stricter on how they reset, which resulted in a dramatic shift in pace. Many would go from resetting seeds that didn't guarantee an enter in under 3 minutes to 2 minutes and 30 seconds, and then even under 2 minutes. Being able to recognize which seed was good to play was also equally as important to having multiple Minecrafts running. If you could, for example, look at all your instances, and if you had to pick between this instance and this one, players who could recognize which seed was better to play were rewarded with a higher consistency of nether enters. The reason for this is due to magma ravines mainly generating in deep oceans, meaning that the darker the color of blue, the higher likelihood of a ravine reaching lava. Small decisions like these are made constantly, and they greatly contribute to separating an average speedrunner from the best. In an effort to reduce load times and hardware gaps between speedrunners, one mod was created with the sole purpose of resetting. The new wall had created such a large gap between speedrunners due to it often requiring mid to top end hardware to work, making Minecraft resetting essentially a pay to win situation. This mod was called World Preview. As you loaded into a seed, you could view the spawn in front of you and decide right there and then whether or not to reset the seed before it had even finished loading. What this meant is that you could explore more seeds with fewer instances of Minecraft. This did, however, make speedrunners with higher-end PCs able to reset even harder. After a while, resetting had become such an integral part of Minecraft speedrunning that speedrunners started looking at previously disregarded strategies in order to ensure that nothing important was ever dismissed. And upon further investigation, a new strategy was discovered. Mapless Buried Treasure or mapless. Now, mapless is a strat that allows players to locate a buried treasure that generated in beach biomes without actually having to use the map in order to do so. Using the Minecraft pie chart in the debug menu, players could locate which chunk the treasure is located in, thus finding the buried treasure without a treasure map. The only problem is that these chests are quite rare to find. Only 1 in 100 beach chunks have them, so finding them 
consistently enough to prioritize them over other reset strategies like village spawns or shipwrecks just didn't seem feasible. But with a new style of resetting, some players actually decided to go for it, and it proved itself in the results alone. 1 minute 24 second enter, 1 minute 18 second enter, and 1 minute and 9 second enter off of Mapless alone. These ridiculous enter times allowed players to get incredibly fast personal bests, and even world records. This is where Minecraft speedrunning is today, and the incredible feat of hundreds of hours of practice, testing and innovation, where the goal is simply to go fast. And it's all thanks to the four cornerstones of resetting. What intent you're using to reset, what structures you need to reset for, what approach you're applying to your route, and finally, but most importantly, how efficient you are at resetting itself. The world record of Random Seed is at the current time of recording 8 minutes and 15 seconds, and a huge reason to that is how you reset.